Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Listeners, before we get to the pod, I just wanted to give a shout out to recent Patreon subs. Uh, They include Joe Farley, Nicholas Modis, Bruce Alter, and Christopher Bessonette, all at the Rook level. So for $5 a month, they are able to get access to ad-free perpetual chess. They can also attend special events with trainers. They can send in questions for guests, whether they be adult improvers or titled players or authors. Uh, So just wanted to say thanks for the support. It really makes a difference. And without further ado, let's get to the interview with adult improver Hans Henning. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are here for an adult improver edition, a nice, wholesome drama-free, controversy-free conversation about chess improvement. For this edition, we are joined by a 35-year-old German who works in tech sales. He works for Google in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, In background-wise, our guest was an avid gamer and Twitch consumer. He got into chess through PogChamps on chess.com. He's been studying it seriously for a bit more than a year and has already gotten his Lee Chess ratings up to about 1,800 Blitz and 1,900 Rapid. In addition to his online chess work, he's been playing a lot of OTB and he's developed. He's he's super serious about chess improvement and has developed his own routine that's working for him and making great progress. So we're excited to welcome Hans Henning to the show. Welcome, Hans. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're happy happy to have you. Um, shout out to Neil Bruce, who suggested you as a guest. I know you guys had interfaced um, a bit on Twitter, and I, I would like to discuss your differing approach to Neil Bruce. But before we get to that, Hans, I'd just like to hear why you're working so hard on chess, <laughs> similar to what I asked Karen, Karen Boyd last uh, adult improver interview. Three hours a day is such a huge chunk of time. It's uh, such a big commitment. So why do you think uh, you're so motivated to work on your chess game, Hans? Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Ben. So uh, I think the, <laughs> the, the very short answer, and I'll expand, obviously, I'll take a step back in a second, is what else would I be doing? <laughs> um, so for me, um, this, this focus was something that I've developed um, roughly 10 years ago. So my background is a bit different as I've flunked out of uh, school um, at 14, actually. I never visited uh, high school. And I was jobless till 25. And at that point, kind of wondered if, my, if I ever going to do something with my life. And I turn my life around and I'm driven by the concept of never leaving potential um, unfulfilled. And I was just purely focused on work probably for six, seven years. And then a few years ago, um, at like 30, 31, 32, kind of wondered if that's all there is to life and obviously isn't. At at that time also, um, my partner and I made the decision that children really aren't going to be a part of our life. And then you just kind of look for purpose because you don't want to look back at 65 and all you've ever done is work. So um, at that time, um, roughly three, three and a half years ago, I picked up cycling first and because I told myself, hey, you know, do something athletic, get into the best shape of your life, right? And I did that for two years, but I realized that, you know, hitting your mid thirties, my athletic potential and the upside associated with that is going to be very limited. I'm just getting old. And chess, I feel, gives me an opportunity to to have that drive and that ambition and to fill my life with something that is meaningful to me and allows me to you know, um, try to continuously get better at something that I'm deeply passionate about. And what drew you in about chess? Like, uh, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but you discovered it through PogChamps, and were you just immediately um, sort of engulfed, or was it more of a starts with casual interest and slowly escalates sort of thing? I mean, 
my first deeper interaction with it was through PogChamps, that's right. I, I think I was uh, a Ludwig Argwin watcher on Twitch, um, but back when he was still streaming there before he went to use YouTube. And um, for one, for for a while, it was just fun. You know, it was hype. Uh, Queen's Gambit had come out, even though I hadn't watched it at the time. Um, it, a lot of streamers were playing it. And for me, it was just an e-sport at the time, right, to, to follow and get into. Um, but then I was attracted by the fact that it was so much deeper than that, right? All the history, the the um, storied past of the game and, and the development it has uh, it has, has had. Um, there was something incredibly beautiful about a game that, from a gaming perspective, is so well balanced, is so well constructed that, a th you know, hundreds of years later, it's still as re relevant as ever. And that's an incredibly rare thing and incredibly attractive and fascinating. Well said, yeah, it, it's a it's a great story, Hans. So once you do get serious about it, like what was next? Because I, you know, we, we talked prior to our interview a few days ago and I was really impressed with not obviously I'm impressed with the chess improvement you've made, but also just your knowledge of the air quotes industry. So once you did start getting knee deep, what did you consume? Um, so once I got into chess, I think I started mainly with like chess.com puzzles. I think for the first month, month and a half, um, I was just doing a tons of puzzles. I was reading about the industry. I think it's, it's hard for me sometimes to put that, take that business hat off. So, you know, you just try to understand the companies behind the whole thing. And, um, I was afraid to play games at first, right? Because I've had these incredibly high expectations towards myself. Oh, when I play and I commit so much time and I'm so serious about it, I must be good. So for the first few months, I, I really struggled to, you know, um, allow myself to play because I was afraid of losing, uh, which obviously will happen a lot. And um, so I started by, uh, you know, on with a few courses on Chessable. Um, common chess patterns, uh, the checkmate pattern manual. I think um, I started by doing chess.com puzzles, um, by doing tactics on chess tempo. I th and I did that for quite a long time. Um, at the same time, I, I got you know a bunch of lifetime repertoires in Chessable and just started drilling openings and just kind of try to figure out, okay, how, how does one actually train chess, right? Mm -hmm. And w what conclusions have you come to? Um, that, so I firmly agree with um, Jakob Agat that, you know, chess is, is um, kind of like playing an instrument. You need to have it constantly in your subconscious and your mind to, to improve at it, right? If you do it once a week, you'll get worse. If you do it twice a week, you stay the same. And only if you do it a lot, you actually get better at the game. Um, I think that it's very, it, there is no ultimately right way to study chess, except that there is plenty of wrong ways. And I think the biggest mistake that I see and one that I've made plenty myself is to kind of get lost in chess entertainment as opposed to chess studying. It's very easy to, you know, watch, uh, watch Hikaru and think you're getting better because he's drawing arrows. He's incredibly good, but, um, that doesn't speak to your chess or yeah, mine it's in that tr case. It's true. Although, you know, some might say chess is a hobby. So what's the difference? But you you feel that it's it's important that, that you make progress with this time you're devoting to chess? I mean, ultimately, um, that's born out of my history, right? I get this knot in my stomach, right? This this pit in my chest whenever I'm doing something that is in air quotes non-productive because I've got this history of having wasted a decade of my life away, I feel, um, uh, being depressed and sitting on my couch and literally doing nothing. And that's time I'll never get back. But it also leads to the fact that now, 10 years later, I can't sit and watch a movie without something in my brain telling me you're going to regret this. And when it comes to chess, it's very similar, right? 
if what I'm doing doesn't have carry a purpose, doesn't kind of have a tangible long-term payoff, um, I struggle um, with justifying it to myself and ultimately then subsequently finding enjoyment. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think that there, there have been a few people I've interviewed, adult improvers I've interviewed who had a similar drive. Uh, uh, Dr. Luca Popov uh, from a while back comes to mind. Um, now, before we get back to the chess, Hans, so what happened when you were 25? I mean, you described this sort of lost decade. Um, obviously, now, you've, as you say, you've really turned your life around quite, you know, great job and uh, obviously well-spoken and trying to m maximize every moment that you have. Um, was it w like what led to, to this change? So as as many good uh, stories, um, this one also started with a woman. My girlfriend at the time uh, was doing a, a, her PhD in uh, molecular biology. And um, she came to me one day and was like, look, Henning, um, I love you. You're a nice guy, but your life is going nowhere. And that's just, this isn't it for me. And, uh, you know, you, you, you talk a good game, you're a nice guy, but this is not going to work. And that told me something um, and, you know, made me ask myself, what do I actually want from life? Right. I don't want people to continue to leave me behind. Right. I want to, uh, not be put in that po uh, position again in the future. And and that kind of was the initial motivation to actually like clean myself uh, up and, and to try to get a job and, you know, go to work. Well, I mean, uh, shout out to your then girlfriend, first of all. <laughs> and uh, and um, it, again, it's it's quite admirable. Now, Hans, you also mentioned that you, you were feeling depressed at the time. Um, so did the, did, and... I infer from that that you no longer are, or at least are feeling better. Um, so what contributed to your feeling better from a mental health perspective? Um, honestly, uh, quitting weed. Um, because, you know, habits and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, I think the more steps you take out of the darkness in your life, um, the easier every subsequent step becomes. Once I had that initial kick in the in the ass, uh, it it just became um, so much easier to take every second step thereafter, right? Um, and obviously, like um, mental health is a huge issue in general, but make, taking that first step is the hardest of all, which makes a lot of the advice you get when you are depressed so so incredibly. Uh, difficult to accept right because it's that mm. first step that that you struggle with most of all was it difficult to quit smoking weed oh yeah it's, it's an addiction of course yeah well some people say it's not addictive uh, well i mean this goes beyond the scope of this podcast but i certainly have a very addictive personality i think going back to chess um if you channel this into um uh, something positive that adds value to your life right my focus on work, right? S spending seven years with uh, an absolute focus on, on my career and, and my success there before sp um, cycling obsessively or not focusing on chess uh, in a similar manner comes from a same character trait, right? So this is just my personality and, and obviously not everyone shares that personality. So it's inherently personal, but um, I can try to leverage this to my advantage ultimately as I have gotten to know myself better over time. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and as you say, this is a chess podcast, so I, I do find your story totally fascinating, but we'll, we'll uh, reel it back to the, to the chess talk. Now, one question I had, Hans, that occurred to me earlier is, of course, you mentioned that you have a, um, you had an an enthusiasm for cycling and we're doing that seriously for a few years and part of your motivation to focus more of your extra training on chess rather than cycling is uh, you wanted something you could do uh, you know through the decades without fear of decline but um, when people look at aging curves of chess players at least at the professional level chess players also tend to peak in their early 30s so do you find that um, discouraging at all or is it not really an issue since you're not looking to be a professional chess player so 
Yes, they peak into the early 30s, but the begin of a chess player's peak is also roughly 10 years earlier than in professional sports otherwise, right? So they have a, what, 20 year peak, give or take, 25 maybe, right? If you say like 14, 15 is when they cross the threshold into grandmaster, being a grandmaster, and then they are, um, you're easily able to play on 2700 plus level until you're 40, that's 25 years. Right. So that is still not comparable to, I think, any other professional spot out there. And I think what that means for, for my journey as an, as an adult improver, that I can improve for a lot longer and that there is uh, also um, a lot of the decline that chess players face comes from the fact that they've invested everything they have for 20 years, which just becomes mentally a mental strain in itself right um the same is i'm not i can't be sure that i will have the same motivation or commitment to chess three years from now five years from now god forbid 20 years from now right i think that is as much responsible for the decline of of people or athletes in general than anything else right you, fam you get a family life gets in the way right you just can't motivate yourself to invest the same amount of hours or as you do uh, you get stuck with bad habits that you've adopted over time it happens to everyone yeah i, I definitely relate to that um well good point hans so hans i want to transition to i know you've got a special emphasis on uh studying openings and i'd like to dig into that but first we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, uses space repetition to help you remember tactical patterns, opening sequences, uh, how to convert end games, whatever it may be. I wanted to highlight a couple new courses out from Chessable. Of course, they have new ones all the time. Friend of the pod, GM. David Howell has just dropped How I Reach 2700. It's about how to break your plateau. He shares practical and psychological tips. Uh, David is always insightful and entertaining. And renowned theoretician Ivan Sheparinov is out with a lifetime repertoire on the Nidorf defense. So if you're ambitious and you like fighting chess, get at it. Last but not least, the Silicon Road to Chess Improvement from Matthew Sadler is now available on Chessable. So one of the many things you guys can check out. And again, they also have free uh, courses that you can check out as well. So be sure to go to chessable.com and check out their offerings. And we are back. And Hans, as we mentioned, you reached out to Neil Bruce because you were you were like, I'm, you know, fellow chess obsessed. I really love studying the game, but I have the total opposite approach. So could you describe your approach to studying chess for our listeners, Hans? So I'm... As you've said earlier, I'm deeply fascinated by openings and um, I probably own more lifetime repertoires on Chessable that I care to admit to. I think what um, fascinates me about openings is the fact that within chess, they allow for an expression of personality or creativity in where other areas of chess do not, right? A table base contains an absolute truth. It's a soft game, right? this position is either winning, drawn, or losing, and that's just it. Whereas an opening allows you to show a part of yourself, and um, I think that attracts me to it. I think um, because I enjoy opening so much, I try to structure all of my work side of the, uh, uh, outside of that around the openings I play, right? If I study um, middle games, well, they can be in the openings um, I play. If I study end games, they can arise out of structures or from openings that I play. And if I want to, you know, expand my knowledge of other structures, I will just change the openings that I play. But I'm deeply fascinated by the concept and uh, of openings because of that. And you've heard trainers say chess is 99% tactics. Um, you know, obviously, I've had. A lot of guests over the years um, preach um, the importance of tactics above other things, especially at the club level. So how did you come to an independent conclusion from, from that? I mean, I get that you are, you're personally drawn to them, but you've also mentioned your desire to maximize uh, your study time. So, um, so and again, I'm not, I don't think anyone has the, the fundamental truth. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just curious, like how you were able to, 
to be so steadfast in, in this view that you developed? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not steadfast or dogmatic, right? I'm sure I am wrong and I'm doing a lot of the wrong things, it's just easy to me, right? Okay. I can do two hours of concentrated work on end games, right? Let's say I work through the pawn end game chapter of, you know, um, Van Perlo's end game tactics, Dvoretsky's Dworetsky, manual and Chereshevsky's end game strategy and Helston's end game strategy, right? And I just focus on pawn end games with these four books and, and I do that for two hours. And after that, I'm completely burned out and I'm ready to go to sleep. However, I can then still drill opening lines, road memorization for another two hours and it doesn't cost me any mental capacity. I'm... This might be unique because I've heard that this is not the case for other people, but just going through lines or road memorization of opening lines, I can always do an extra hour. I can always just on a Saturday after a busy or a busy day at work, no matter how mentally fatigued I am, I can always do this. And that just makes openings very easy to add on. Now, um, of course, tactics are vitally important. I think I've done maybe 30,000 chess puzzles on various websites, the 700 puzzle rushes on chess.com, um, the lead chess equivalent puzzle racer, maybe 600. I um, have done a lot and a lot of tactics, right? Like I said, one of the first courses I ever got in Chessable was Common Chess Patterns, which is an excellent tactical resources. On the advice of um, the chess dojo, I got CT art um, as well and, and have started working through that. You know, I've looked at the woodpecker method and, and done all of the, you know, in air quotes, classics. But um, very much, I fe often feel like this is something that is a necessary evil. It's not the part that I find most fascinating about chess. Okay. And you mentioned the, the openings are can be a method of expression that that when you find ones you love um they're they're sort of a way to um, communicate your love for chess so um which openings fit that category for you after all of these uh lifetime repertoires uh checked out i mean i i have a lot of lifetime repertoires and i think i use exactly none of them <laughs> um they become a reference manual if anything if you're obsessed and fascinated with the idea of an opening, right, it's a very short um, path to be begin using chess base and, um, you know, evaluating lines using um, stockfish and Leela and discussing them with, with coaches. What I've learned is that the right opening for me needs to be very concrete, right? I started out um, roughly... Um, 250 days ago playing the Catalan. And I love the Catalan, the incredibly strategically complex opening. It also doesn't, at my level, which is admittedly low, uh, it doesn't punish opening mistakes black as much as some other openings, right? I can, uh, it is a lot more effective for me comparatively to memorize knight d5 sacrifices in the Smith and Mora and potential responses to that that happen on move 10 because going wrong is just disastrous for my opponent. And um, so the choice of openings over time has just become the search for sound but concrete lines that allow me to leverage my advantage and memorization effectively. Yeah, and, and in that regard, I think the Smith Moore is a good choice. Um, I know it's it's not super popular at the grandmaster level, but it's it's tough uh, below that. And how much theory would you are you often sort of rattling off when when you play? Like, what's what's a common move number for you to be out of uh, prep? So I actually um, a, f a close friend of mine, um, uh, Jonathan Litvin, actually developed a proprietary piece of software that I'm using to check every single online game that I'm playing against my opening books. And um, so I've actually got empirical data of my games and when I'm actually out of book. And I think the average game is in three to casual, um, probably around move seven, which is not a lot. Now, um, 
there was the odd game, you know, and there was something deeply satisfying of encountering a theoretical queen sacrifice in move 16 of the BG5 knight off, right? Which happened to me. You're and black? Or? I was black, yes. Yeah. And uh, white uh, sacrifices the queen, um, which has been played, I think, five times over the bottom master games with uh, four draws and the white win. Um, and uh, encountering that in a 3-2 blitz game, at my level, um, because in a casual game, you just randomly get paired with people sometimes a lot higher than you are. So that's why I'm playing casual as well. And that uh, there was something intensely satisfying about that as well. But I would say on average, uh, I think it's seven, eight moves. And um, it really does depend on which lines they chose, right? Um, in, uh, you know, some sub uh, because my book doesn't go as deep in some um, sidelines than it would go into a, in a main line. Yeah, and I think like uh, shout out to a friend of the pod FM Nate Solon. He's done research on this and written um, convincingly about it on his blog Swishenzug, where he talks about the fact that if you really study, um, you know, even even up to twenty two hundred level, something like that. It's it's not unusual for someone to be out of book at move seven. Um, I I do reasonably well in my openings, but I have some openings where I'm going to move seventeen. You know, in theoretical positions, but it's just as common for me to be, as you say, is on move six and uh, you know something slightly offbeat, and suddenly I don't. I I, I might have an inkling what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know for sure. I mean, um, obviously, to a certain degree, um, this is something that um, is fine, right? As Christoph Zilecki says, right? Um, uh, long variations are just condensed middle game plans, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you an idea of what you should be doing in comparable situations. And uh, as I've said, it depends on the opening, right? Um, in some slower positions in um, like the close Sicilian, uh, I, it's fine if I'm out of book on move five, right? I, I wouldn't want to be out of book on move five in the Vanderville attack uh, on, uh, in the Karo Khan, right? Um, because going wrong there might be multiple hundred centi pawns that I'm losing right there. But uh, that goes back to trying to find in concrete opening lines which punish mistakes more, right? And, and then then becomes a search, right? If they if they intend to deviate and move six, maybe choose an opening line where that is more of a problem than some others. Okay, and so we've got the Smith Mora as white against the Sicilian, the Nidorf. Are are you willing to reveal and the Nidorf as black? Are you willing to reveal any other of your uh, your your openings? Um, so. There is obviously a difference between, as I'm so fascinated, right? There is more than just one choice in most most areas, right? As there should be, um, just based on the fascination um, with openings. But uh, for example, I've, I've realized that playing the Night Off and the Grunfeld, actually, while they are obviously the best, well, among the best openings that you can play in chess, they also they also give white a plethora of choice, mm -hmm. which makes it uh, easy for white to, you know, uh, deviate with equality or near enough equality. So, whereas um, I think that for at my level playing the Banco Gambit, which has very strong win rates, I think at the submaster level and is um, creates a very interesting imbalance position where the black player probably can take advantage of deviations a lot more directly. So mm. that's kind of how I base my choices. It's not unsound, it's not super GM ready either, but it allows me to take advantage of what I enjoy about chess. Yeah, and, and it's come up before on the pod. I think it's it's a great study hack or whatever you want to call it to to really focus on realized results at a given rating range rather than like what the engine says so when you when you say something like the benko scores well 
uh, at the club level? Are you using the LeechS uh, Opening Explorer or another tool to to get that data, Hans? Um, I think the LeechS Opening Explorer at specific rating ranges is an excellent choice to to look at that for that reason, right? Um, <clears throat> as there is a correlation, I think. But uh, it's a combination of engine evaluation and um, about engine evaluation and the actual realized results. I do want to play sound openings that are reasonable, right? I think that you know the Danish Gambit has an excellent, uh, excellent practical results in Blitz games. I don't think it fits the bill. Okay. For example. Yeah. Makes sense. For me personally, uh, anyway, obviously, everyone can play whatever they feel for. But And Hans, you've also mentioned that you have a unique and uh, extremely rigorous approach to organizing your openings using chess base. Could, could, you, um, could you shed a little more light on that? Well, it's, it's, it's not my approach, right? So I think um, uh, fairly early in my chess journey, I joined Jakob Agat's killer chess training site um which is frankly excellent and he um has a course on that site by sam shankland on how to study openings how to maintain and manage chess base files and how to go about creating your repertoire um using chess base engines and you know relevant master games annotations and so forth um it has become for me an invaluable resource because it's a lot more practical and con um than you know lifetime repertoire of something that i haven't looked into myself that i haven't you know played around in or uh, so uh, yeah, I think Sam Shanklin's course has probably been the most valuable resource for me when it comes to how I approach building my opening repertoire. Yeah, and of course, not everyone listening to this will have chess base. Um, I've mentioned before, I do have chess base. I find it to be imperfect, but better than <laughs> the alternatives. Um, is there anything you could share on an audio-only podcast, like a particular uh um, takeaway from this uh, series from Sam Shanklin, which I believe that John Hartman also, who's a killer chess training member, is also a fan of. Um, open, create, ultimately, I think, opening files require still a lot of annotation. Pros and um, symbols, right? Ultimately, just clicking a few moves together is not the work that you're supposed to be doing. And my own opening files in my chess base are annotated. If you don't have chess base, right, a lead chess study will do the trick. However, it's not about adding a bunch of lines to the lead chess study. It's about annotating those lines and trying to understand them. There's a lot of free resources, right? You can um, create a your own course in, in Chessable, or you can add them to the Chess Tempo Opening Explorer after creating it in a study in Lee Chess to drill it, and that's that's great. It it fulfills much of the same purpose, but unless you actually did the work to internalize these concepts, uh, ultimately you're going to be lost in the middle game after move seven because that's when your opponent has deviated. That's great advice. Um, yeah, and I, I could I could take that to heart as well. I do have opening files where every blitz game. I, I even though I am uh, I have chess base. I generally just use Lee Chess at least until I get to Lee Chess studies at least until I get to sixty games. But yeah, I, I definitely could stand to write more notes about explaining a certain move. Now, Hans, let me ask you, because you've described so many products already, all the lifetime repertoires you own, uh, killer chess training, um, and uh, chess base. So obviously, the cost of this stuff adds up. Um, how do you uh, justify spending all this money on uh, on all these chess products? Um, I mean, my better half would ask me if it's justifiable, but <laughs> yes, as would, as would many. <laughs> um, and ultimately, the answer is 
uh, a lot of these are pointless or have turned out to be pointless, right? There is probably some good thought that I put into that in the moment and then you figure out, I don't need a lifetime repertoire on the uh, symmetrical English because after I looked into the symmetrical English, I preferred the King's English. Um, however, uh, ultimately, I am lucky enough to be in a very fortunate position in life at this stage. And uh, that also means for me that you know, chess is not the richest community in the world. Um, and if I can give back to creators, right, I'm a Patreon of the chess dojo, for example, then that is meaningful for these creators, right? So I never regret any th of these purchases I've made because ultimately, um, if more good chess content gets created and consumed, that's ultimately good for chess, right? Um, the only reason I earn money is to spend it because it won't up buy me an upgrade in heaven. Mm -hmm. So if I work this hard, what else am I going to do? That's a good attitude. Um, and you, and your significant other, you, you, uh, you managed to keep, to keep her uh, or him or her at bay. Um, yeah, I, I keep her at bay, but that's also the fact that, um, I have, I don't have any bad habits aside from that otherwise, right? I think I went shopping for clothes the last time before the pandemic. Um, I don't drink any alcohol. We never go to restaurants. We never order takeout, right? Like there is, it's just, if you allow yourself to have an expensive hobby, you need to make concessions somewhere else usually. And as long as you're willing to make these concessions, that's fine. And obviously the fact that um, there are no children's uh, uh, children that you know uh, have uh, you know priority um, makes a huge difference as well naturally. Yeah, it makes sense. And and yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're you're sacrificing a lot in in other regards. Um, but and I'm sure that the chess community appreciates your support. <laughs> um, Not through that, but you know, um, being part of a community means that you should give back to it. And for me, this means concretely, you know, I'm I'm up for to become the treasurer at the Irish Chess Union, right? And be part of uh, the um, board of directors at, at the Irish Chess Union. And I'm also in the process, I've, I've gotten my first national arbiter norm to become a certified chess arbiter to ultimately then also get feeder arbiter norms and, and being able to run f um, tournaments here in Ireland. Uh, because it allows me to give back, right? Because then the success of, of Irish chess is something that I can take pride in, and that's important to me. That's great. Um, how'd you end up in Ireland, by the way? Oh, work, right? My, my partner um, is uh, from uh, France, but she also works in tech, in the tech industry, and uh, Ireland as the European hub for many of these multinational tech companies just offered opportunities to the both of us, um, of which we were lucky enough to take advantage of. And outside of that, it's just I Ireland is beautiful. I can only yeah. recommend it to everyone. Yeah, I really want to go. Um, all right. Well, we're going to bring it back to chess in a minute. Hans has a lot more resources to discuss. But first, we've got to take one more break and hear from our sponsors. I've been playing a bit of Blitz lately. And whenever I'm active online, it's fun to go to aimchess.com and ask their almighty algorithm to give me some insights from my games. It scrapes the sites, the playing sites automatically and gives you actionable intel. In my case, the real takeaway this time was I got a 7% in resourcefulness in recent games. Um, that's not very good. I need to get better at that. I need to fight harder when I'm losing in a blitz game, look for tricks. And of course, aim chess, as it highlights various aspects of your game, strengths and weaknesses, uh, shows you positions from the game so that you can practice, you can review tactics that you missed uh, and learn lots in a fun way when you review. So please check out aimchess.com if you decide to subscribe use the code perpetual 30 you can also use the link in the show description to get the same discount 30 percent off at aimchess.com and and we are back and it is time for a sponsored segment here on perpetual chess where we highlight premium features available on chess.com and this feature is known as the chess.bomb 
Now, Hans has already mentioned that he's a puzzle aficionado. I think a lot of listeners will know that by being a premium member, you get access to chess.com, unlimited chess.com puzzles and puzzle rush. But Hans, you were telling me you're also a fan of the video series by uh, Grandmaster Johan Helston. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Johan Helston has a bunch of pawn structure specific videos on uh, chess.com. I think back when I was playing the uh, Catalan uh, quite frequently, um, his video on on close Catalan structures was actually something I found incredibly enlightening. Um, it's it's very hard to find good resources uh, on on some openings and and his videos on chess.com were really excellent as is the content that he provides overall in general. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his content, but somehow I feel like and and when I interviewed him for Perpetual Chess this year, it was one of the most popular interviews of uh, 2022. I think a lot of people found him quite insightful, especially on the the topic of uh, chess improvement. But sometimes those uh, lessons, which again, this is under the sort of um, um, lessons feature of of uh, the chess.com premium memberships um, can slip through the radar. One other feature I wanted to highlight, because another thing that's been coming up on the podcast a lot is this idea of solitaire chess as espoused by Grandmaster Alex Fishbein and Grandmaster Gregory Kaidanov, this idea of playing through games and uh, and guessing the move. And a friend of the pod, Jeremy Kane, who of course works for chess.com, uh, also pointed me to the guess the move features. So you can go to like a play like Magnus uh, feature on chess.com and uh, the lesson will pause at a certain point and have you guess what Magnus played. So just a little reminder of the many features available for premium members. If you do decide to sign up uh, for becoming a premium member, please use the link in the perpetual show description, speaking of ways to support uh, chess content. And on that note, that concludes the chess.bomb. Now, Hans, Speaking of Johan Helston, I know I understand that you also took a lesson or two with him. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think I had a total um, of like maybe five sessions with him over over the last 375 days that I've been playing chess. Um, I think uh, and the, the, the lessons I, I I have to say are excellent, right? He's he's a fantastic teacher. I think his videos also that he does as part of the U.S. Chess School that the Chess Dojo then broadcasts on Twitch and uploads to the YouTube channel are also another um, point uh, to that. But um, yeah, I've, I've taken a bunch of lessons with him because I reached out to him uh, because his books are excellent because um, he's he's incredibly um, uh, well regarded when you know and uh, get uh, when he appears on a podcast such as yours so um usually the work with him was really insightful and 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 very interesting yeah um i agree and and are are you working with any other coaches so i've i've uh, as i've said earlier i've i've um gotten a membership to the killer chess training i've also had uh, a lesson, a few with the Yusupov Chess School. Similarly, obviously, because the books of Arthur Yusupov are, are quite well known, which was a very different experience where Johan Halston was very concrete. Okay, this is a puzzle. This is a situation. Show me a recent game. Let's go over that. Have you considered this? Why haven't you? What was your thought process? Um, the Yusupov Chess School was very, I had a very different approach um, where um, after asking about my ambitions, the suggestion was to focus on end games for the next two years, which was a maybe a more Eastern approach in comparison mm -hmm. to the Western uh, nature of of Helsen's training. But ultimately, I've realized. I also before I, before I get to what I realized, I also reached out to a few other um, coaches. I've um, reached out to uh, Andras Toth, um, who unfortunately did not have time. And uh, I think that's a common occurrence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of his content. I've He's done great, his, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, so I thought, um, based on his content, I thought he he'd be okay with that shout out. Um, so I've um, also realized, though, for me that uh, chess studying is very much a, a solitary exercise, right? It's something that. Um, for the vast majority of time is work I need to do by myself. 
it's nice to jump on a call with a close friend and discuss uh, a, an annotated game from, you know, and a you know, every man chess move by move book um, in um, an opening of my choice. But ultimately, the vast majority of my work I have to do by myself, and this goes back to what is worth the money you invest in chess. I felt that the return on investment for uh, a book like 100 Endgames You Must Know that I've literally worked through in its entirety a dozen times is just vastly superior than an individual hour with a coach, right? Okay. Um, because if I break down the the, you know, the money spent per hour of work invested, uh, I, it's just a vastly more efficient use okay. of my resources. Now, I do have to note for the record, as someone who, who does get weekly lessons, um, and uh, I, I get your broader point, but it sounds like, for one thing, you're especially self-motivated, uniquely self-motivated, it sounds like to me. Um, and number two, people should just do do what works for them. For me, what's irreplaceable about having a coach is particularly analysis of my own games. But um, but as we've said many times, you know, no one knows the secret formula, and we're each entitled to uh, our own approaches and opinions. No, of no doubt, right? I I would never claim um, that um, it's my way or the highway. As I've said earlier, I'm I'm pretty sure that I do a lot of the wrong things, and I make up for that with by pure brute force, right? Mm -hmm. The hours I spend. But it's ultimately uh, important that you spend the hours and then subsequently what keeps you motivated, right? I'm trying to get to a reasonable level. I'm not trying to bridge the gap from 2650 to 2700 where every minute needs to be considered. I can just brute force a lot to get to 2000, right? And that makes it easy to do the wrong things and still profit ultimately. Right. Um, I think when it comes to your to your point um, about analyzing your games with a coach, I think analyzing your games, as everybody says, and annotating them is incredibly important. I, I did this uh, with Johan. However, I had gone uh, through the games beforehand and annotated the, them by myself in an over four hour process. So I, I annotate every one of my over the board games and I'm sure we'll get to my over the board play in a minute. And I then subsequently annotate them, which takes me on average four hours per game. Wow. And once you've done that, obviously going over them again with, with a grandmaster or generally a chess coach is insightful, but it's relative value decreases a little at least, right? Um, it always depends on how deep you go, and I'm not saying there isn't an incredible insight that I might have missed, right? Game, uh, moves that I will consider natural might not be. Moves that I feel might be too computerish aren't. Um, I'm not good enough to make these judgment calls. But uh, ultimately, a lot of the benefit of that then um, gets taken away, which, which brings me to the point that if you invest the time beforehand, um, the situation might be different in this case for me. It is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and as you said, uh, to to each his or her own, and and uh, no one Always. no one knows uh, exactly uh, what what they should be doing. Um, and Hans, one other topic I wanted to talk about is uh, OTB chess. I mean, you've you've gotten knee deep already. So could you could you describe the experience of uh, getting into to competitive tournament chess? So. I started playing chess 375 days ago, which is roughly, obviously, at the beginning of September 2021. And then I had my uh, first over the board tournament um, at the New Year's All Play Alls uh, of the Irish Chess Union in January 2022, which was a 10-player, a nine-round, round-robin event um, for under 1,200-rated players which was my first chess tournament. Um, I I have been incredibly fortunate that the Irish Chess Union has to, is doing an incredible job of organizing classical chess tournaments, uh, you know, um, beyond, you know, the, the, the more common weekend type, three games a day type tournaments, literally like one week, nine round, round robin events, which has allowed me 
to play a 42 over the board 9030 so far this year and i hope to be able to add another 2025 further uh, 9030s over the board this year um, my plan is that the Benidorm Open this year in December will be my first international, large international open. And uh, then next year, hopefully, um, some of the larger ones like uh, Reykjavik um, or Dortmund, Biel, and, and see how we'll go there. Sounds like so much fun. And how would you, for listeners who haven't played over the board, how would you compare the experience to playing online? Um, first of all, the chess community in Ireland is, is fairly small, right? So I have played some um, kids three times in 42 games. Like I've, I've literally had like two opponents I've played three times, uh, three opponents I've played twice, just because the community isn't that large. That means, uh, and then you sit together in the breaks and you play, you know, hand and brain, backhouse, blitz, and, and it's just a very communal feeling, which I think you, you can't replicate online, which is incredible, right? The chess community is very open, very inviting, and um, has been incredibly uh, good to me, and I've been incredibly appreciative, right? Similarly, um, it's an, it's 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 a great um, you know a few things are as nice as um, you know like being able to um, ensure that um, the Ukrainian refugee is able to play the tournament for free and see him win the grading prize, which means a lot more to him than it would to me. So I think um, uh, over the board chess just gives you a sense of community that even though I'm a member of, of the chess dojo um, or, and I've made a lot of friends online, uh, via chess uh, isn't able to replicate. Now, on, on the game itself, it, it's incredibly fatiguing, right? A four, four and a half hour chess game um, gets tiring. I remember I was playing three tournaments back to back at the end of June, beginning of July. And I withdrew out of the third tournament after 11 classical games of chess in six days because I was so fatigued. I offered a draw in a winning endgame a pawn up with 20 minutes um, on the clock, which the engine then subsequently showed plus three because I just couldn't. I could not bring myself to keep concentrated to stay at the board. I was just burned out um, because of how exhausting it becomes and is and can be, uh, which I think is very different to, um, you know, the more casual nature of online chess. You would think with your cycling background, to me, it seems uniquely suited to prepping for these long days at a chess tournament, but it's still, still wore you out. I mean, I work in tech sales, as you said at the beginning of the podcast, right? So end of June is the end of the second quarter. So I had mm. also come for, from back to back 14 hour work days just before I started that oh, three yeah. three uh, tournament run of back to back to back tournaments. So that, that played into it. But yeah, I think that endurance sports are very important. Fabiano Caruana is, is I think, famous for his running and and his the great shape he keeps himself in and i'm sure that is part of it yeah no i think it's it's super important but but yeah i mean and obviously it does sound like you had some extenuating circumstances but yeah the fact that even someone who you know you you look fairly fit obviously i can see you even though this is uh, audio only and with a with a cycling background still found it exhausting is uh daunting but again that's why i think uh listeners should at least try a chess tournament because there's there's no, um, you, you can't, you can't fathom it until you do it, at least in my opinion. Um, and the last topic I wanted to talk about Hans, uh, is resources. I mean, you've consumed so much in this slightly more than a year. So, I'm. Um, uh, are there any like favorites that we, that you haven't mentioned as of yet? So back when I started playing chess um i prob made a list of all the books i want to study so I, I created this massive excel spreadsheet 
um, which has like tons of rows where I divide it into, you know, opening books and courses, strategy and games, game collections. And um, I probably came up with a list of 150 resources in chess that based on reviews, I feel um, might be worth reading eventually in one shape or form. Realistically, I won't even touch half of that <laughs> over my life. But um, so then I've realized for myself that you know, I, as much as I, I, I would like to skip some steps, right, uh, when it comes to strategy, I'm not going to start with the complete manual of positional chess by Zakaev and Landa, even though it's excellent. I might want to start with, for example, Andras Toth Chess Principles Reloaded series before going to Winning Chess Strategies by Syrawan, before going to Hermann Grossen's Chess Strategies for the Club Player, uh, mastering chess strategy by Halston, before then maybe considering uh, Zakaev and Lunders' um, complete manual of positional chess. I think there's a, um, a ton of great resources out there. Um, what I found personally in incredibly um, uh, in helpful um, or fascinating was books that talk about how you want to approach your chess studies, right? How to Study Chess on Your Own by Kulia Savage, I think is one of those books that I worked through. Um, then Move First, Think Later by, by Hendrix, because mm -hmm. it, you know, very much kind of tries to go over the myth of, you know, is prose actually helping you or not? Um, uh, then uh, I think other books that I've recently worked on that I found very interesting, I think like a super GM by Adams as a mm -hmm. tactics and calculation um, exercise book, I think was excellent. I'm a big fan. Um, when it comes to the classics, uh, understanding chess move by move, of course, by none um, and secrets of modern strategy by Watson were, were kind of books that I've, I've looked through to understand the general ideas. In a similar vein, the Silicon, uh, because I'm technologically driven, the Silicon Road to Chess Improvement by Sadler, I thought was fascinating in a way um, to, to look at um, how to leverage engines and how engines have changed chess. But um, because of how many resources there are, it's very hard to, to break down um, what I uh, prefer and what not. What I would say in general is that um, the amount of good chess content has exploded, not just on YouTube and Twitch, even though there as well, of course, or on Chessable, but even as far as, uh, as um, uh, published books go, I think if you, if in doubt, just studying books that were released in the last 10 years is probably a good baseline because there was a lot of more questionable books that might not have been engine checked that might not hold up as well as some others. Yeah, there, there's so many fantastic books and uh, the ones you rattled off, I'm a big fan of nearly all of them. Um, so definitely some excellent recommendations there. I mean, those are the classics, right? And then it comes really down to what direction do you study want to do you want to study, right? Just when it comes to, for example, pawn structures, right? There's um, chess structures from Flores Rios, which I'm currently working on, which I thought is excellent. But there is um, also, you know, Shanklin's small steps to try and improvements for, on pawns or the power of pawns, like Neil Bruce obviously talked about these in your podcast. Um, uh, extensively when he did his pawn book um, comparison, um, which are also excellent. Like I said, I think it's hard to find books that, uh, it's, it's very easy to form a, create a list of 50 truly excellent chess books, um, which is more than you'll be able, ever able to complete in a reasonable time frame. You're Amen. spoiled for choice. And we're not even talking about the videos of, you know, Naroditsky online or, the chess dojo. Yeah, well said. Um, and and last thing, Hans, I'm curious to what extent you have goals, whether they be reading or process related when it comes to your, your chess. I mean, um, of course I have goals, right? Both process related as well as writing related. Um, I think um, 
I don't know yet what my ceiling ultimately will be. Any goal I set to myself might be wildly too high or wildly too low. So at the moment, it's a lot easier to have process-related goals. My rating increase has been too drastic, right? Like I said, I went from 600 chess.com blitz uh, September last year to um, uh, the mid 1800s uh, lead chess blitz right now. And that I think translates to like 900 points if we just use the chess goals rating comparison, give or take. But that means that any rating goal is, is kind of becomes a crapshoot. So from a process perspective, um, at the moment, it takes me incredibly long time to get through individual books, right? As I've mentioned before, um, I've been working on different endgame books, right? Um, the ones I had mentioned were, were um, Shereshevsky's, Helston's, Dorecki, and Van Perlo. And I would choose generally a topic, let's say pawn and games, and work on all of these books to that specific topic to immerse myself. And to properly internalize that takes months. Right, to be to get to a point where I feel like okay, I've got a, gra a grasp of pawn and games, which I don't. So I would like to be able to progress through the content at the same le high level a bit quicker going forward. Right, setting myself time goals for I would like to complete a chapter in Mauricio Flores Rios' set chess structures in uh, two weeks instead of a month, for example, and that meaning having actually internalized the lessons that he's trying to to get across. Uh, that that would be great. And I think it's also realistic because as I get become a better chess player, understanding and comprehending the lessons being taught in that content become easier to access for me. Makes sense. Well, you've got a great approach, Hans. Um, you know, it's 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 a fascinating story. I love to hear how you've turned your life around. Uh, first of first and foremost, but also how you've uh, carved out a place in, in chess for it. Um, do you, do you have anything to add as we uh, wrap up, Hans? Um, like I said, I think um, at the beginning, ultimately this comes down to where you find purpose in life. It would have been easy to say, okay, I um, I define myself through my work and that's it. But making the conscious step to trying to find something outside of, of, of work that defines who I am was important to me and chess spoke to me. And um, now that means I want to deeply immerse myself in the community and in the chess world, which means I want to get better at chess, but I also want to you know, contribute to the chess community as a whole so i hope that my openness and me sharing details about my you know my history my past my journey is able to maybe contribute and give back to the community um, it's something that's deeply important to me and and i hope it's it's uh, it resonates with you know at least someone out there yeah, I'm I'm confident that it that it will. Um, and if uh, people want to either send you a message or possibly play you a game, um, is there uh, any way to potentially do that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I as you can imagine, I'm not a recluse, and uh, so I'm happy always to make new acquaintances, meet new people, play a game of chess, talk about chess. I you know, my girlfriend will be happy if, if, I, if she doesn't have to hear more about it. So um, you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at uh, I am Hans Henning. Okay. And I'll link to that so people can just click through. Uh, well, Hans, this has been awesome. Uh, congrats on, on your, again, you're turning your life around and your early success in chess and your sort of uh, clarity of vision about, uh, you know, what, what you hope to both contribute and receive, uh, from the chess world. It's been, been great to chat with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, 
at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.